Hey guys, welcome to my channel, and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. The case of Susan Wright, the blue-eyed butcher of Texas. Anger is a powerful negative emotion, during which a person typically seeks to harm themselves or those around them. The English playwright John Dryden once said, Beware the wrath of a patient man, for he will exact revenge when you have forgotten both the man and the very cause of the wrath. Long accumulating negative feelings, pain and resentment will inevitably find an outlet, and a person who always forgave and gave one more chance to make things right can become the most ruthless judge and executioner. The case of Susan Wright in the early 2000s shocked everyone with its incredible cruelty, but the merciless perpetrator stood before the court and, it seemed, received deserved punishment. However, several years later it turned out that not everything in this story was so clear-cut, and a bloody conclusion was preceded by many years of patience, resignation, and silence. This family, at first glance, seemed ideal, but no one could imagine what was happening in their home behind closed doors. But let's try to understand from the beginning the case of the blue-eyed butcher to comprehend what pushed a fragile young woman, a mother of two children, to such a desperate and simply monstrous act. Who is Susan Wright? Susan Lucille Wright, nay which, was born on April 24, 1976 in Houston, Texas, into the simple family of Velma Sue and Jimmy Lawrence Witch. She was the eldest of two children of her parents, raised alongside her biological sister named Cindy. From an early age, Susan was an active and sociable child with creative talents. During her school years, she was seriously involved in dancing and aspired to become a choreographer in the future. The girl had a bright, attractive appearance and a slender figure, always having numerous admirers and she herself loved being the center of attention. After graduating from high school, despite her efforts, Weich couldn't get into college. However, she didn't lose heart, deciding to take a short break and save money for her education. For several months, she worked as a dancer at one of the popular nightclubs in the city. There, the young blonde performed topless, gaining some notoriety, which she was certainly not proud of. She decided to quit this job and never return to it, using her savings to pay for evening courses at a nursing school. Susan always aimed for independence, so alongside her studies, she took a job as a waitress in a restaurant to support herself. Soon, she realized that medicine was not her true calling, and she struggled financially to pay for her education. Therefore, the young blonde abandoned her courses, focusing on her work instead. The Romance with Jeffrey Wright In the summer of 1997, 21-year-old Susan met her future husband, Jeffrey Andrew Wright. Their first encounter was at the Galveston restaurant where she worked as a waitress, and he stopped by for a meal. He was instantly captivated by the beauty and radiant smile of the blue-eyed blonde, leaving generous tips and becoming a regular customer from then on. Jeffrey took a while to ask her out, but eventually mustered the courage to get her phone number. Susan later recalled that the man began calling her daily, sometimes several times a day, arranging romantic dates and small surprises, like sending flowers with touching notes to her work, and in the evenings, he would meet her and walk her home. The man was eight years her senior, but this minor age difference didn't particularly bother them. He was attentive, very sweet and caring, quickly winning over Susan. However, it soon emerged that Jeffrey had some issues with alcohol and the use of controlled substances. He claimed to have left drugs in the past and promised to give up alcohol completely. The naive young woman believed him. She was truly in love for the first time and felt they could overcome any challenges together. Soon, Susan discovered she was pregnant and hurried to share this happy news with her beloved. Wright seemed pleased at the prospect of becoming a father, but made no decisive moves. He didn't propose, and they continued to live separately. Confused by her boyfriend's behavior, Susan took the initiative into her own hands. She insisted that their first child should be born in wedlock, and her partner simply accepted her conditions. By the time the couple officially legalized their relationship, Susan was already eight months pregnant. They didn't have a grand celebration with a white dress and a tiered cake, opting for a quiet wedding without guests or witnesses. Around this time, they purchased their own home in the quiet Harris County, Texas, 
moving in just a couple of weeks before the birth of their child. The perfect family. In December 1998, the Wrights welcomed their first child together, a son named Bradley. In 2001, Susan became pregnant again, and in the spring of 2002, she gave birth to a daughter, Kaylee. The couple also got a small dog named Buck, had their own comfortable family car, and seemingly lived a life that resembled the embodiment of the American dream. Jeffrey worked at a local construction company, and after the birth of their children, Susan, by mutual agreement, became a homemaker. She took care of raising the kids and creating a cozy environment in their family nest. Neighbors, with whom Mrs. Wright maintained friendly relations, spoke of her as a kind, friendly, and sociable young woman, a caring mother, and a loving wife. The family indeed seemed perfect, but as it turned out, the reality was quite different. It was later revealed that her husband was extremely demanding in every aspect. Susan spent her days cleaning, doing laundry, and cooking. Jeffrey only ate fresh, home-cooked meals, and she couldn't prepare meals for two days at a time or reheat leftovers. The house had to be in perfect order and cleanliness, a near impossibility with two small children. Jeffrey's clothes needed to be washed almost daily, as he wouldn't wear the same item twice. If any of these rules were broken, it led to insults, humiliation, and even physical abuse. Financially, Jeffrey turned out to be extremely stingy. The romantic, who once gifted flowers and presents, was gone, and he now only gave his wife $100 a week. This was meant to cover cooking, maintaining the house, and buying everything necessary for the children. Susan had to account for all expenses to her husband and provide receipts. Jeffrey did not quit drinking as he had promised earlier, but that was just the tip of the iceberg. He began using drugs again. He categorically denied his addiction, referring to his drug use as light doping to cope with work stress and stay in good shape. However, under the influence of these substances, he often became aggressive, capable of hitting his wife or even their young son. Whenever Susan pleaded with him to seek professional help and undergo rehabilitation to overcome his destructive habits, Jeffrey reacted with outbursts of anger. He saw no problem with his behavior, arguing that Susan married him knowing about his alcohol and drug use, and thus she should now accept and live with it. Remarkably, Jeffrey's parents were also aware of their son's weaknesses. They sympathized with their daughter-in-law but felt helpless to assist her. The Last Straw According to the woman, her husband began displaying aggression towards her almost immediately after they started living together. This manifested in physical, emotional, and intimate abuse. Initially, he would apologize each time, promising it would never happen again, and she wanted to believe him. But soon, Jeffrey stopped apologizing, and the violence in the family became a commonplace occurrence. Jeffrey visited the gym three times a week to practice boxing. He said these workouts allowed him to blow off steam, adding that he would definitely take his son with him once the boy was a bit older. On Monday, January 13th, 2003, Wright went to the gym after work as usual. He returned home on edge, seeming excited and nervous. While his wife was preparing dinner, he decided to tell his son about boxing and demonstrate a few techniques. At one point, he got carried away, misjudged his strength, and hit the five-year-old boy. The child burst into tears and the father tried to soothe him, hoping his wife wouldn't hear. Susan indeed pretended not to notice, but this incident was the final straw for her. After dinner, she went to put the children to bed while her husband remained in the bedroom, where he took another dose of controlled substances. What happened next varies in different accounts. The woman claimed that as soon as she entered the room, her husband attacked her, wrongfully took advantage of her, and attempted to end her life with a knife but she managed to wrestle the weapon from his hands, and the ensuing confrontation was purely in self-defense. However, her story changed multiple times, and the investigation's version presented at the trial appeared more credible, becoming the official account. Seduced, immobilized, and brutally ended a life. Susan decided to use her dancing skills to seduce her husband and lower his guard. She entered the room in a short silk robe worn over her bare body, performing a tantalizing show for her husband. Then, she suggested a role-playing game involving tying up, to which he readily agreed. She used three of Jeff's neckties to bind his hands and right leg to the bed. 
His left leg was secured with the silk belt from her robe. Once he was immobilized, Susan improvised a gag using her own underwear, adding to the guise of an intimate game. To set the mood, she lit candles and turned off the lights. Jeffrey was bound hand and foot, securely fastened to the bed, with a gag in his mouth surrounded by dim lighting. Initially, Mrs. Wright took one of the candles and poured hot wax on the man's chest. Although painful, it still resembled a part of their game. Then the same fate befell his intimate area, and soon the pain became unbearable. Jeffrey did not immediately realize what was happening. He tried to free himself, tried to scream, but to no avail. Meanwhile, his wife repeatedly struck him with a small, sharp knife she had brought from the kitchen. She started with the groin area, moving up and down, slashing his genitals, legs, abdomen, chest, arms, neck, and face. At first, Susan acted slowly, voicing her grievances with each strike, recounting the insults, humiliations, and abuse she had endured. Then she began to cry and struck faster and faster. Forensic experts would later count 193 shallow knife wounds on the deceased's body. The majority of these wounds were not fatal, and the man was conscious for most of the ordeal. Her actions indicated she was in a state of despair and intense emotional turmoil, with her lawyers insisting on a state of affect. She couldn't stop even when her husband showed no signs of life, and she hadn't yet considered what she would do next, or how she would handle the body. Shallow Grave in the Backyard For the next several hours, the woman simply sat on the floor next to the bed where her husband's body lay. She then looked around and realized the bedroom was covered in blood, and she needed to act before dawn. Susan cautiously peered out the window, ensuring no neighbors had their lights on, and that it was quiet and deserted outside. Her gaze fell upon a shallow pit that Jeffrey had dug over the weekend to install a fountain in the backyard. A plan formed instantly. This pit was to become the grave for her despised spouse. To move the body from the bedroom to the yard, Susan used a common garden wheelbarrow. This aspect raised many questions for the investigators as a petite, slender woman managed to single-handedly load and transport a man much taller and twice her weight out of the house. There were suspicions of an accomplice, but these speculations were never confirmed. This seemingly fantastic strength, appearing out of nowhere, gave the defense another argument to insist on a state of affect. Under the cover of night, the woman moved her husband's body into the pit and buried it, though lightly covered would be more accurate. She then showered, removed the blood-stained curtains and bed linen, placing them in several trash bags and dispersed them in different bins. The bloodied mattress was simply flipped over to the other side as she didn't know what else to do with it. The remaining time until dawn was spent scrubbing blood from the floor, walls, and carpet. The carpet presented a problem as a large stain proved impossible to remove. Resourcefully, the lady doused it in bleach hoping the chemicals would destroy any traces of the violent confrontation that had occurred in that room. Assaulted and fled? That morning, Susan called her husband's parents, who lived in Austin, Texas. Sobbing, she informed them that her husband, under the influence of alcohol and controlled substances, had assaulted her and their young son, then wreaked havoc in the house, spilling a bottle of bleach on the carpet, before declaring that he was fed up and leaving her. Jeffrey's parents were shocked. They knew their son was far from perfect and genuinely felt sorry for their daughter-in-law. But upon hearing that he had hit the child, they immediately offered for Susan and the children to come and stay with them for a while. However, the young mother refused. She added that she would file a report with the police and disclose everything that had been happening in their home. Two days later, Mrs. Wright went to the police station as her husband's sudden disappearance was raising more and more questions and something had to be done. She reported that she and her children were victims of domestic violence at the hands of her husband and needed protection. Susan managed to obtain a restraining order against her husband from approaching her and the children, although she already knew very well that her significant other would never be able to come near them again. As evidence, Susan showed bruises and cuts on her arms, which she claimed were inflicted by her husband with keys when she tried to fend him off. There was also a small bruise on Bradley's face, and the boy confirmed that his dad had hit him. At first glance, the story told by the tearful woman sounded quite plausible and logical. Her husband, 
under the influence of a mix of alcohol and controlled substances, attacked his wife and young son, and then, realizing what he had done, got scared and fled. But as time passed, Jeffrey made no contact, which became very suspicious. It appeared he had run away without his belongings, documents, and even his mobile phone was left at home. The man hadn't shown up for work or at his parents, and none of his friends or neighbors had seen him. It was as if he had vanished into thin air. Such behavior is typical of criminals who decide to lay low. But he hadn't ended a life or inflicted serious injuries to warrant such a flight. The Horrifying Truth Susan found it unbearable to stay in the house where she had confronted her husband and where his body was buried in the yard. She started to feel as if he were still alive and about to rise from his grave for revenge. She was practically losing her mind, and their dog buck kept barking and trying to dig up the burial site. On January 17th, having taken her children, the perpetrator went to her mother's house. Her mother was aware of what had happened, but upon seeing her daughter, she realized the full extent of the truth. Velma simply asked, You killed your husband, didn't you? Her daughter burst into tears and nodded. She confessed what had happened and revealed where she had hidden the body, repeatedly saying she didn't know what to do next. On her mother's advice, the next day Susan contacted a lawyer named Neil Davis, to whom she confessed to ending her husband's life and trying to conceal her crime. The experienced defense attorney learned all the details, thought through the possible scenarios, and on January 19th called the office of the Harris County District Attorney. Davis reported that Mrs. Wright had ended her own husband's life and buried his body in the backyard, as she herself had confessed, and was ready to give a statement at the police station. On January 24th, 2003, Susan voluntarily went to the police, stating that she would make a full confession. Her story was disjointed. She got confused in the details and sometimes contradicted herself. She spoke of her late husband as if he were still alive, claimed she was afraid of him and asked for protection. Consequently, she was subjected to a psychiatric evaluation, which revealed a nervous breakdown and depression, but overall, Wright was capable of understanding her actions. The Gruesome Discovery When the remains of the deceased husband were extracted from the makeshift grave in the backyard, Investigators were astounded, having never witnessed such brutality before. Experts counted 193 knife wounds on the victim's body, 8 in the groin area, about 30 on the legs, 23 on the shoulders and arms, 22 in the abdominal area, 46 on the chest, 23 on the neck, and 41 on the face. Only one head wound could have been the cause of death. All other cuts were superficial and individually posed no direct threat to life, suggesting that the man suffered a prolonged and agonizing death while conscious, as his wife repeatedly struck him with a small knife. Deep marks were found on Jeffrey's wrists and ankles from the ties and belt used by his wife to bind him. The nature of these injuries indicated that the victim had tried to free himself, but was unsuccessful. Notably, the ties and belt remained on the body. Traces of candle wax were also found on the deceased's chest and groin area. Mrs. Wright claimed it was accidental, as her husband had knocked over a lit candle onto himself, but the prosecution believed that the hot wax was more likely a form of torture inflicted on the bound victim, meant to cause suffering. In the mouth of the deceased, his wife's underwear was still present, acting as a gag that prevented him from screaming or calling for help. Toxicological reports revealed traces of alcohol and several controlled substances in the deceased's system. Under the influence of such a cocktail, the man could have indeed behaved aggressively and irrationally. The bedroom where the confrontation took place appeared normal at first glance, except for a large bleach stain on the carpet. Susan had spent considerable time cleaning up, which was evident. But once special chemical agents and equipment were used to reveal wiped-away blood traces, the scene presented itself in an entirely different light. Blood was found everywhere, even on the ceiling, and the mattress was thoroughly soaked in it. The Start of the Trial and the Defense's Version The trial of the accused began at the end of February 2004. By that time, Mrs. Wright had been in custody for a year, and her children were being cared for by her parents and sister Cindy. Her lawyer was well prepared for the trial, 
and had worked extensively with his client. Susan was almost continuously in tears as she recounted that horrific night and the events leading up to it. According to the woman, she had suffered years of abuse and cruel treatment from her husband, but when he started raising his hand to the children, she couldn't bear it. The defendant claimed that on that fateful evening, her husband returned from his training in an agitated state, began demonstrating boxing techniques to their five-year-old son, and said that the boy would also take up boxing. When a frightened Bradley refused, his father hit him in the face. Susan then put the children to bed and decided to have a serious talk with her husband, urging him to seek help at a clinic. However, he became angry, grabbed his keys, and was about to leave. She tried to stop him, which led to a struggle during which she sustained injuries to her palms and wrists. Then, as the defendant claimed, her husband struck her, causing her to fall and momentarily lose her bearings. When she came to, she saw Jeffrey holding a knife. The woman's testimony became highly inconsistent thereafter, and she couldn't explain how the weapon ended up in her hands. Her lawyer attributed this to a state of affect, arguing that it was why his client, having seized the knife, began to strike and didn't stop until she had inflicted multiple wounds all over her husband's body. Regarding the ties and belt, Susan claimed she attached them to the victim's limbs after the confrontation to secure him to the cart and transport him to the yard. The wax, as previously mentioned, supposedly landed on his body accidentally from a candle on her bedside table that she lit in the evenings instead of a nightlight. However, she couldn't explain at all why her underwear was found in the deceased's mouth. The Prosecution's Version and Verdict The prosecution's version and arguments were far more convincing and logical. Experts proved that the deep wounds and abrasions on the wrists and ankles were inflicted while the man was still alive, suggesting that the binding was part of an intimate game used by the defendant to lure the victim into a trap. Consequently, the presence of a gag in the man's mouth was also reasonably explained. Furthermore, all injuries were inflicted at a certain angle, as if the perpetrator was above Jeffrey's body or sitting astride him, not in the midst of a struggle, which would have resulted in a different pattern of injuries. All the cuts were made from the front, as the victim was lying on his back and securely fixed. Whether Susan had premeditated her husband's demise and planned to use the pit he dug for the fountain as a grave was not definitively established. However, the prosecution leaned towards the theory that she had carefully planned everything, hoping to receive a substantial sum from insurance. The case received widespread publicity, with Susan being dubbed in the press as the Blue-Eyed Butcher or Blonde Meat Grinder. Jeffrey's relatives demanded the harshest punishment for her, while most neighbors pitied the woman, recalling occasional bruises on her body that resembled marks of physical abuse, which she attributed to her clumsiness. Initially, the prosecutors sought life imprisonment for Mrs. Wright, but later softened their demands to 45 years of incarceration. In March 2004, the defendant was found guilty and sentenced to 25 years in prison. She showed no reaction to the judge's words and appeared completely detached. A year later, Susan's lawyers attempted to file an appeal, but it was rejected. New Developments and Reduced Sentence In 2008, Wright and her defense team filed another appeal. This time, a new witness's testimony significantly influenced the course of the case. The witness was a woman named Misty McMichael, the wife of former NFL champion Steve McMichael. In the mid-1990s, she had a prolonged relationship with Jeffrey Wright, even being engaged to him for about a year. She shared her experiences of enduring physical abuse, humiliations, and cruel treatment from Wright, which led her to break off the engagement and permanently sever ties with him. Considering these new circumstances and the witness's testimony, Susan's prison sentence was reduced to 20 years. In 2014, at the age of 38, she became eligible for parole for the first time, but was ultimately denied. She received a second denial in July 2017. Finally, in the winter of 2020, after spending 16 years in prison, the blonde meat grinder was released. She was 44 years old at the time of her release. Waiting for her outside the prison walls were reporters and photographers, at the sight of whom she burst into tears and pleaded to be left alone. 
It's worth noting that Mrs. Wright's trial received extensive media coverage and was even broadcast on the national American television network, Court TV. This story later became the basis for an episode of the popular documentary TV show, 48 Hours Mystery, as well as an episode of The Secret Lives of Stepford Wives titled Deadly Love, which aired in 2014. In 2012, the feature film Blue-Eyed Butcher was released, starring actress Sarah Paxton as Susan Wright. Additionally, in 2014, Canadian documentary filmmaker Chloe Balland released a 17-minute short film titled The Wheel of Fortune, inspired by the trial of the Jeffrey Wright case. Thanks for watching, guys. Subscribe to the channel and also don't forget to click the bell. There are many shocking stories ahead.